from the aim here, and then in quiet sustainability and common senses and food self-provisioning of the practices that um, we've researched and promoted throughout the research community. Yes, there's no large Congress centers, uh, but Degros dislikes smart buildings, those where the water necessarily has to come warm from the taps and you have to purchase drinking water from the vending machines. Commodified higher education institutions that are opposed to degrowth philosophy and science are also a problem to hold a, uh, an event of this size, but we focused on largest, they're also undergoing the largest reconstruction post the earthquake of 2020. We, on the other hand, focused on repurposed and patchworked venues of modernist international expo fair that was once internationally renowned and where you will be able to see both its history in the art presented and also uh, how it can be reused today. We'll also use the inner city neighborhood cultural center that those of you who participated in the ODN meeting already had a chance to see. That's in the very city center. Public culture venues like this one, like this architectural citation of a modernist painting as you look at the building from the outside. And then the stunning Jamia in the downtown where we'll open our own dedicated exhibition to, uh, to the themes of the conference. And yes, crises and earthquakes of 2020 and storms of 2023 are trials of resilience and are also a practice of shared vision, of recovery, of reinvention. Through these events, we do build again. They're, they're, they're a test and, a, and an invitation to change the status quo, which all our theory that the degrowthers gather about tells us that we do need to change. And much has changed in the city of Zagreb and the community since the last physical degrowth conference in Malmö in 2018. Hopefully much of it for the better, but much of it remains for us in Zagreb to figure out and to renegotiate in the next days and years. With all of your help, because we're not doing this in isolation. We're part of a global community that's aware of challenges that Yelena so re well reminded us of. And you and I are not disinterested bystanders in the sixth mass extinction on the only planet, the only habitable planet that we know of. We have the heritage of our education and the heritage of the infrastructure that we're relying on to give us the privilege to reflect, to think about, to debate, and to come up with strategies of the change that's needed. Whether this is your first or your ninth gathering of this type, in this room or at keyboards worldwide because we're being streamed as well, we will expose the myths that falsely claim that humanity created the fossil fuel thermo-industrial civilization accidentally landing us in the current predicament. As Diana will tell us later this evening, we've known about this for quite some time. Our conferences in general were provoked by technocratic responses to the social and economic shock of the global financial meltdown of 2008. But then they were magnificently reinvented for the pandemic-induced crisis of the 2020s when we held successful events online and partly live. And the burning northern hemisphere of 2023 and still we managed to get you to Zagreb, hopefully on trains uh, and coaches and not flying in. So I wager here that degrowth is no longer just the theoretical stun gun or the optimistic horizon. The ninth international conference takes place in an emboldened and much more self-aware community, both among us degrowthers and in the city. On behalf of the organizing committee, on behalf of our team of volunteers, and the Stena that supports us, I welcome you to the 2023 Zagreb Degrowth Conference and Festival. Thank you. Okay, could you now indulge me with the short polling? I, as a sociologist, prefer uh, social service. So for the first time, who is at the Degrowth International Conference in their life? Could you raise your hand, please? Okay, well. We didn't expect that. <laughs> So, number nine in the headline indicates that there is now a significant history of these events since we are also celebrating 15 years, years of international degrowth conferences. Lots of energy was invested during that time in enabling people from all around the world to frequently convene and share their knowledges and experiences, but also worries and anxieties about the world that we live in and about the actions needed in order to avoid future collapses ahead of us. In order to have all of that invested human energy coordinated and enabled, 
The Growth Support Group for international conferences is for years working hard in order for conferences to be successful. Part of the group are also Alexandra Kovesh, a.k.a. Sandra, and Vincent Liergy, a.k.a. Vincent. Sandra usually works at Corvinus University in Budapest as ecological economist and during this week will give us an interesting talk on the role of utopia in degrowth vision of transformation. She is for a long time very active in the degrowth movement and if you're interested in economics for rebels, Sandra hosts a very interesting English language podcast of the European Society of Ecological Economics. She's also the vice president of the same association. Vincent is an engineer, interdisciplinary researcher, and also the coordinator of Cardigonomia, a center for research and experimentation on degrowth, a social cooperative for sustainable logistical solutions, and local food distribution using cargo bikes in Budapest. So if you're in Budapest and you need good companionship and good and fresh and healthy food, Sandra and Vincent are definitely your people. So please, Sandra and Vincent, say something to the crowd. Thank you, Branko. Um, on behalf of the Degrowth Support Group, um, we would like to warmly welcome you um, uh, to this conference. It was only five um, years after uh, uh, the Budapest conference uh, when Mladen said that he's ready to host another conference. And um, I think he probably needs a checkup uh, of his memory because um, he was heavily involved and it was immense work. And, um, but I think we need these kind of devotion and devoted people to, uh, to change the world. And what is degrowth about, if not about changing the world? Um, so um, we would like to uh, thank not just um, Laden, but all the local organizing committee for um, uh, all the work they have put into uh, um, organizing this event and hosting us. And we are also grateful to the municipality for uh, uh, supporting our cause um, and being here with us. Um, we are looking forward to not just uh, the conference, but also uh, to the convivial atmosphere of the Degrowth Week and um, all the cultural events. Um, Thanks to Anna. Thanks a lot, Sandra. I'll be coming back. <laughs> yeah, the story started, actually the story started 21 years ago in France. And that's maybe not the ninth International Degrowth Conference we are celebrating here, but maybe the tenth. Because in 2002 in France, there was a, not called yet Degrowth, but there was a very important funding event for Degrowth. At the UNESCO, there was this conference under the name Deconstruct Development, Rebuild the World. And this conference was co-organized mostly with a lot of friends from Global South, who came to Europe, who came to the Global North, who came to this Western world to say, we don't want your growth model of society. We don't want this imperialistic narrative about development. It's killing the planet. It doesn't make you happy. These people, when they arrived in Paris, they didn't find the, the people as happy as a level of overconsumption and destruction what we have in the Western world. And moreover, moreover, it's something which is killing the biodiversity of cultures, what we have all around the world, and what we want to protect, what we want to preserve, and what we need. So degrowth is about that. It started then. There was this great idea to launch this word décroissance, translated later in 2008 for the first international degrowth conference, also in Paris. By degrowth, décroissance created a lot of frustration, misunderstandings, and so on. But it was a great intuition. It was an idea coming from somebody who was working in marketing business and who anticipated something which, unfortunately, is now everywhere, which is greenwashing. And can even speak about green, social, convivial washing. He anticipated that with the rising awareness about the physical limits to growth, with the beginning of the collapse of our Western civilization, the dominant system will use the new emerging narratives around degrowth, the new hopes, to keep on doing the same, to use marketing, advertisement, social networks, mass media, to still make us desire something which is toxic, and to still make us buy more and more and more things. So in between, we had a lot of international degrowth conferences, also regional conferences, 
to be honest, and we've been going through, you have to be crazy to organize such an event. It's a crazy effort. You have to be even more crazy to do it two times in your life, like Mladen. I think he's the only one in the world who would dare to do that. So again, thanks a lot for the local organizing committee. And thanks a lot to all the other ones in the past who are welcoming you. We are quite amazed to see so many new faces. Thanks to uh, Barcelona, thanks to Venice, thanks to Montreal, thanks to Leipzig, thanks to Budapest, thanks to Malmö, thanks to the first conference of the European Parliament, thanks to Mexico City, which was maybe back to what's happened in UNESCO with Global South, Global North dialogue, and we need to keep uh, the contact with Global South. They have so much to offer to us, and we have so much to liberate, to do to liberate them from oppression, what we impose to them with our uh, consumerism and so on. And in between there was COVID, and all these new people arrived in time of COVID. We gathered mostly online in Vienna, in Manchester, in The Hague, we could meet first at the EU Parliament for a particular conference. It's not really the soul of this type of international degrowth conference. And now we are here together in Zagreb. Uh, so I wish you a, a great week here in Zagreb. And luckily, after Zagreb, we don't have to go long without a degrowth conference because uh, on behalf of the Degrowth Support Group and the European Society for Ecological Economics, um, I'm delighted to announce the next conference, um, the 10th International Degrowth Conference and the 15th um, Conference of the European Society for Ecological Economics in Pontevedra, Spain, um, organized by yet another committee team um, from the 18th of June to the 21st of June next year, so that's uh, 2024. They are promising no less than um, uh, establishing Pontevedra as the European capital of degrowth in 2024, <laughs> after, of course, Zagreb being <laughs> the capital in 2023. Now, these may seem like big words, okay, the capital of, of degrowth. But these conferences really do provide a space and a boost to the movement. So um, yesterday at the fourth uh, International Degrowth Assembly that took place in the Ribniak uh, Youth Center, we witnessed nothing less than the birth of the International Degrowth Network. Um, really, truly amazing young activists um, had been working really hard to come up with a concept, um, with an organizational setup that is democratic, inclusive, and really reflects the values of degrowth. And I think they managed incredibly well. And, um, and I really urge you to listen to them on... Um, on Thursday evening where you can meet them, you can hear how this um, uh, organization based on sociocracy um, can work and, um, and also participate in their workshop um, on Friday if you can. And um, to close out these thoughts, um, let me share with you a personal story. A couple of months ago, I, uh, I was invited to give a talk on, on degrowth to an international finance uh, um, conference. And, um, and I thought, yeah, well, I'll, I'll cause a bit of emotional discomfort to them uh, by talking about degrowth and, um, um, and that's all. And then they'll have this discomfort and go home. But um, I, stayed for the, uh, I stayed for the roundtable discussion that they had after my talk, and um, a French investment banker said something that was truly more than just the discomfort. She said something very pragmatic. And she said, um, she said to the other bankers, like, do not just think that you have to listen to talks on degrowth 
because they sound vaguely interesting. You have to listen to talks on degrowth because our clients, the investors, they listen to them. They fear them, they're scared and worried. And so they should be. <laughs> Indeed, Sandra, and they are afraid, and they are right to be afraid. Uh, I think yesterday on Twitter, uh, Elon Musk attacked us. Uh, Macron in France is unable to spend a day without attacking degrowth and totally terrorized with that idea. Uh, I think we became the main enemy also of illiberalism, which is uh, winning everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, but degrowth uh, has to happen. The end of growth is here, the end of growth has to be implemented. If not, we will totally destroy the condition of survival of our civilization. But degrowth is also more and more desired. There are more and more converging surveys all around the world showing that majorities of people would rather go to a life with less, to share more, to slow down, to care, and not anymore this crazy world of over consumerism, but to desire something is unfortunately not enough. We keep on running to the same dynamic. Degrowth is desirable. I have the opportunity to experiment it in my daily life, and I can tell you that it's not easy every day, but it brings a lot of love, a lot of enjoyment of life, and degrowth is about enjoyment of life. And this week here in Zagreb, like any other former international degrowth conference with a particular soul of Yugoslavia, the Balkan, of Croatia, of Zagreb, with this particular history you will find here, and I am a big lover of this region, and I have the opportunity to travel a lot here and to bring a lot of uh, time uh, degrowth here in conferences and so on. You will get a great opportunity with that wonderful soul to connect, to meet, to get that hope and energy to go home later and to implement degrowth. So welcome to Zagreb, and thanks again to the local organizing committee. And now, every conference needs a lot of energy, material and non-material. In other words, besides love, we needed some money and materials to pull this out. You can see in the printed materials the names of the organizing and supporting partners that have supported us in organizing this whole week. I would like you to help me express the gratitude with a big applause. Among the supporting partners is also the city of Zagreb. <clears throat> it's really a pleasure to have Tomislav Tomašević, the mayor of Zagreb, Daniela Dolenec and Luka Korlajet as the deputy mayors here with us. Tomislav, besides being a mayor, is a political ecologist and I think his first international degrowth conference was in Leipzig. Daniela, besides being a deputy mayor, is a political scientist and I think her first degrowth international conference was in Budapest. Luca, besides being a deputy mayor, is an architect, and I'm quite sure his first degrowth conference is this one. <laughs> but regardless of their experiences in the degrowth conferences, they have individually and collectively been engaged in various topics which are of relevance for degrowth theory and movement. So it is a real treat to have them among us tonight, and I would like Tomislav to share his thoughts and feelings on the future ahead of us and on the actions needed now, but also Daniela and Luca to join and to give your feelings and thoughts. So please, guys, join me. Evo, dobar dan svima, hvala lijepo što ste došli, nadam se da imate ove aparate za prevođenje. No, I'm just kidding, I'll switch to this. First of all, it's really, really nice to see you, so many here. But not just so many, but really I'm uh, pleasantly surprised to see so many new people on the first uh, degrowth conference which gives, I think, some of us who are on other degrowth conference a lot of optimism for the future of this approach and of this philosophy. I have to say, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll try to be brief uh, and I'll tell a short story from 2012 uh, in September. 
I, after many decades of different international career, working as UN advisor, being an activist, working on different NGOs and movements, I received a full scholarship on University of Cambridge to study political ecology, sustainability, political ecology was mentioned a few times, uh, for those who maybe don't know, is studying power relations within environmental changes. And the first day when I arrived to University of Cambridge, uh, there was a plenty of events happening, and I decided to go on one. And that was before I he even heard about the word degrowth. And uh, the, the topic of this conference was, or the title, was called Is Infinite Economic Growth Possible on a Finite Planet? It was, for me, what was quite surprising. It was really a good discussion. Uh, what was really surprising for me was the level and also the diversity of speakers that were engaged in this kind of discussion at the University of Cambridge. So this was 2012. So there was a main editor of Ecologist, but there was also the main editor of Financial Times. There were professors of economy, heterodox but also mainstream. There were professors of ecology. There were different members of the parliament uh, from both parties, or actually few parties, more than, more than two. And it was really at that time that I was wondering, you know, is this kind of discussion possible in Zagreb and Croatia? And how much it will take before it happens? And then uh, I, I got back uh, and uh, with the group of us, together we were building the Institute for Political Ecology and then the Degrowth Conference in Leipzig happened and then the Degrowth Conference in Budapest. And actually in Budapest I was wondering, okay, of course, Mladen was already ambitious at that time. I was wondering when the Degrowth Conference will happen in Zagreb. And I was wondering also, would it be possible, going back to this 2012 experience in Cambridge University, would it be possible that it's opened, let's say, by the mayor of Zagreb? <laughs> so yes, uh, at that moment I, I didn't think, you know, I thought probably it will happen sooner or later. But I was never expecting at that moment, no, I was hoping to, that I will become the mayor of Zagreb, doing the welcome speech and opening speech at the International Degrowth Conference. So. And, and it, many things have changed since then, and also a few people already mentioned uh, the degrowth, and we were really discussing this issue of uh, constant economic growth, within the limited natural resources, is it possible, what kind, of, uh, what kind of problems it makes, this kind of systemic approach. But you know, these are the issues that were discussed in May in the European Parliament with the President of the European Commission, with Ursula von der Leyen. So things are changing. I mean, there's more and more debate on these issues. There are more and more people involved. There are more and more researchers. There are more and more activists. And I think things are moving. The question is if it's moving fast enough. I'll just mention a few things and uh, I'll give floor also to, to the deputy mayors. Uh, I'll just mention some of the things that we are doing and that we will do in the future as the city. Uh, the energy transition, first of all I have to say, and this was also mentioned in the, well, in the opening speeches, uh, the climate change, uh, the, the consequences of climate change are really becoming more and more severe which is something that some of us were talking even in 2002. That was my first international conference, which was the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, South Africa. So even then, we were saying what will happen, and now, unfortunately, it is happening. So it was already mentioned that, for example, in July this year, Zagreb was hit by the strongest storm in our recorded history of measurements. So in 160 years that we are measuring the wind, this was the strongest storm that hit Zagreb. In only in 13 minutes, it created a lot of damage and a lot of danger and a lot of insecurity for people. So it, for example, it destroyed or it damaged, it damaged 10,000 trees. 4,000 of them are completely destroyed. 
And we are, one of our policies, not only is to replace them this winter already, but also to, uh, to make this a double count. So basically for these 4,000 trees, we will, we will find a place and locations to, to uh, plant 8,000 trees. And we will increase this even more in the year to come. We are doing the energy transition, for example, two days after this, we are opening a huge solar panel uh, plant on the, on the roof of a huge uh, hospital. And we are uh, actually, we are, this Zagreb is a disgrace in terms of renewable source of energy, especially on public buildings. So we were uh, increased 50 times the capacity of installed solar panels on public buildings in only four years. This doesn't show just our ambition, it shows also how little we had before. So we are, we are also, of course, uh, constantly working not only on how public buildings can do these projects, but also how citizens can do these projects. And we are also striving for more citizens', citizens energy, or let's say citizens controlled or owned sources of energy, especially renewable source of energy. Um, okay, I can talk now for ages about different things. Um, I think the inflation is also something which is uh, a huge problem, which is socially unjust. It's hitting the poorest. We as the city are trying, first of all, to absorb the inflation to different, first of all, uh, postponing the prices of the communal services, but also, or for example, pension homes that we that have a lot of losses and that we cover their losses without increasing the price for our senior citizens through different measures from social policies that try to alleviate uh, the, the poverty, including the energy poverty, which is also quite big in the city of Zagreb. Again, uh, there's a lot of uh, projects and policies on waste management. I'm sure you will hear about them. They are under a lot of discussion all the time. We have a lot of projects and investments in the water infrastructure. City of Zagreb, unfortunately, is one of the record cities in terms of leakages of water. So we have 50% of water leakage in our water infrastructure. So 50% of the water does not come to con water consumers, but is lost. And because we had four decades of underinvestment in the water infrastructure, that these are mass challenges that we were left to deal with, together with all this crisis that we have and we manage the city. I mean, from the earthquake, which was also mentioned in 2020, to uh, the war in Ukraine, to inflation, to energy crisis, to the biggest storm we had, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, I mean, one of the things before, b beside uh, all these policies is also to make the city more resilient. And that's why we have a lot of investments in the firefighter services that are really saving lives in these kind of situations. But also the flood uh, protection programs, uh, for, I'll just give one example. The biggest, uh, the channel which saved the, the Zagreb because after the, the, the storm we were also afraid of the flood that might hit Zagreb, uh, which was in the middle of August. So in the middle of August, Zagreb was under threat of a severe flood. And what saved Zagreb was the channel, which was built in the 70s, 1970s, which was used only seven times so far in the 50 years to take a part of the water of the river of Sava, which of the wave which was coming from Slovenia, and probably you unfortunately heard about massive floods in August in Slovenia. Two, two thirds of the surface of Slovenia was hit and all this water or 80% of this water was coming to the river of Sava and increasing the, 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 the level of the water. And this uh, channel which was built 50 years ago was used only seven times and was now used and we have to strengthen it. We have to strengthen all this flood protection because unfortunately this is the future that we have to face. So. Those who think that this year was a record year and it will not happen again in many events, in my mind, are deeply wrong. And we have to adapt the city to deal with these challenges, of course, not only in ecological way, but also in socially just way. So there are many challenges for our policies, but we are committed to continue with these policies towards more democratic, more ecologically su sustainable and more socially just future. Thank you.
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm also very happy, very excited uh, to be with you today. We're very happy to host you all in, in Zagreb. And basically, I only wanted to say more or less one thing, and that's uh, that we are here, uh, the three of us, not only because hopefully we look better when we're all together, uh, but because uh, we want to actually illustrate uh, that apart from uh, some of the changes that we're, we're bringing to Zagreb uh, in terms of program, in terms of where we're heading, we're also changing Zagreb in the way it is governed. Uh, for us, it is uh, crucial, it is fundamental, if you like, uh, to govern it democratically in an egalitarian manner and um, to govern honestly, uh, to, be, to not be afraid uh, to have honest conversations, to not be afraid to uh, take difficult decisions when we believe they need to be taken despite everything. In, in, in not everything, but despite, let's say, um, you know, media landscape and everything else. Um, honest conversations, difficult decisions, um, and pushing in the direction that we believe is necessary and which Thomas have just outlined, a sustainable future, a more just and democratic society. That's where we're heading. And that's why we're very proud to have the, the Degrowth Conference in Zagreb, because this is exactly the forum for that. This is a forum for envisioning alternatives. Uh, I believe it's a forum for honest conversations, um, for utopian thinking. We have to have that. We have to have um, optimism. And we have to be able to imagine different futures but also honest conversations about, about what can be done. You know, for us, it's important to talk about Zagreb, and I, I do hope that some of the conversations in the upcoming week will be very focused on you know, concrete and pragmatic problems that we have and how to solve them. I think that would be one of um, a very important outcome of this conference. So in that sense, as I say, we're very, very proud to have you. Um, we'll hopefully be able to see you during the week um, it, to the extent that our, our um, program uh, allows. And um, that's about it that I wanted to say. I'll, I'll give the word to Luca now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure and honor to be here to join you tonight uh, and to feel this atmosphere and to feel this warm welcome. Um, thank you, organizers, once again. Um, yeah, uh, I've. Um, checked the program uh, and it seems rather interesting and uh, I'm looking forward to all the lectures and the talks and the panels and uh, I as an architect as, and a city planner I'm going to take part in one of them on Thursday uh, dealing with uh, cities in post-growth era. Uh, so I think in that regard we have a lot to learn and a lot to show as well. Um, yeah. <coughs> I'm excited, so uh, thanks once again, and uh, enjoy your stay in Zagreb. <laughs> so, before we close, and I'm sorry, I mean, this is what politicians do. Uh, we, we say it will be 10 minutes, and then it's always longer. Uh, I just want to congratulate and thank to all to organizers, uh, to all the organ organizing partners, uh, to people, I mean, like Vedran, like Mladen, like Branko, like Miljenka, like Jelena, Tina. I'm sure I'm going to forget, I, I forgot somebody, but to the all, whole organizing team for putting this together. Uh, I also looked at the program. It's really, I think, diverse and ambitious and interesting. And also to our, to our best schedule, we will do our best to uh, to participate in the program as much as possible. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to Zagreb. Enjoy this Degrowth Week, and we pronounce the ninth International Degrowth Conference in Zagreb open. Uh, thank you. In terms of the change, usually in the protocol after the mayor speaks, nobody speaks. But this is also one of the things that we are changing. Uh, so before our tonight's keynote, we would like to have some sort of a information on overall week, because if you've seen in the program, it's not only the conference that we have organized, it's various kinds of other events uh, during this whole week. 
And through the program, it takes a little bit of time, but I think maybe we can, in a couple of minutes, just go through the overall week to show you on the map where the venues are and what could be expected, and then maybe to be a little bit faster, and then to give to Diana uh, the floor and for her lecture. So, Mladen and Jelena, and please, Batroslav, right? They told me Batroslav from Regia will give us. Do we have the time? Batroslav, Batroslav. Oh, Batroslav. Bravo, Batroslav. Thanks, Batroslav. Um, so I'll just start you with a couple of infos for tomorrow. We start uh, 9 a.m. sharp. <laughs> we want you to be there. Uh, we, want, we want you to be punctual. So it's a keynote in the morning, and then right afterwards we have parallel sessions. Uh, coffee breaks and lunch will be served on site, and in the 3 p.m., 3 o'clock p.m., we will have afternoon keynote, and then again, uh, panel sessions and parallel sessions um, till the evening and then we go to the center Tribnyak. we um, we get loose and we watch some movies at the environmental film festival um, uh, I think it's also important to say that registrations will be open at the Zagreb fair uh, we will see you tomorrow morning. It's about 800 meters west from here. Um, it's a walking distance from here, but depending on where you're staying, you have the um, uh, public uh, transportation infos on the leaflet program here. Um, I will not go through everything in the program. I don't know, Mladen, I leave it to you if I have forgotten something. Um, no, there's nothing forgotten. We'll be coming back to you uh, every day with service information after the afternoon keynote. Uh, in terms of the program, it's like school. There's few important things to remember for the next three days. We start in sharp in the morning with the keynote lecture. Uh, it ends at 10. All of you who are giving speeches, you need to be in your rooms at about 5 to 10, assigned in the detailed program that's online on what used to be known as FRAB. Um, then there's a coffee break, then there's another set of parallel sessions, then there's a lunch break. Lunch will be served, as Jelena said, for all of you. And at 3, uh, for the afternoon keynote, we open to the general public as well, which means if you really want to get a good seat, get there on time. It will be in a large hall, but get your seat in time if you want to be in front. Um, it runs uh, for the afternoon keynote. We'll then do uh, a bit of service announcements again, and then you have another set of parallel sessions, and then we have the evening plenary panels, which are like keynotes but with more speakers. Um, they'll also be in larger rooms, uh, and they shouldn't generally overlap with any parallel sessions, so you should be done with your own presentations uh, for the day. Sometimes when uh, last-minute changes or scheduling conflicts insisted, we had to put a few sessions uh, to overlap with those, but generally that's not happening. And then uh, there's the film festival in the city centre. Uh, that structure is repeated every day except for Friday when we already in the afternoon, right after the panels, we start moving. And can I get the map of the city now as well? Um, yeah, so we're at MSU now, uh, the, the, uh, the yellow square. Uh, you can walk or get to the Velesayam, the fair, uh, where all the main three days of the conference will happen. But then uh, the exhibition opening on Friday night is at HDLU up in the city center. So either use bikes, public transport, or get a longer walk. Uh, and then on Saturday, which is a full day of events when we're also open to public, but we're also very much engaging with all of you. So it's not, a, it's not an end day. Saturday is a full-on day when we have both the presentations of non-academic sessions mainly so that we can interact more easily with generally interested public, but also... Uh, and then there's the music at the end. I was going to get to that, but okay, Sorry. speeding up. There'll be lots of stuff on Saturday. There'll be free lunch. It's happening in the youth center. Hopefully the weather will be good. We'll spread out in the park. And then there's a concert and music to end the day. Uh, and then the conference really uh, uh, finishes. Um, I wouldn't take any more of your time because we really need to hear Diana's uh, full-on lecture this evening. But that's my run through. Um, please be there sharp tomorrow morning. Please adhere to the timings tomorrow morning so that we can start the conference running smoothly because by Friday you'll get accustomed to the, uh, to the running of the times. We'll have a really annoying bell which will chase you out of the rooms and out of your coffee breaks, apparently. 
Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for additional registrations for those who haven't registered tonight and for start of the program. And then uh, anything that comes up um, we'll uh, bring up in the afternoon speech. Please remember that we're not a professional service. We are largely a band of volunteers, and this is a self-organized event. So think about what you need to change, what isn't working. Come to us at Info Points. There'll be two Info Desks constantly present at the conference venue of the Velesam. Uh, say to us what, needs, what you're suggesting needs changing. There's art and loungy spaces as well in the Velesam, so you don't have to work all the time. You can relax there as well. Hopefully, when the weather improves, we'll also be outside. I'll tell you more about that later, but all in all, don't just run after a professional service. We're running this uh, as an event for all of us. So come and speak to us about how we can change uh, or improve things or if you want to do uh, something else differently, especially concerning your sessions. Right now, thank you very much for your patience for all this time. Thank you very much for your welcoming and opening speeches for all of our guests. Uh, and I invite uh, Diana to come and join us uh, for the lecture. Now. Ooh. I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about Professor Diana urge -Vorsatz. She is a professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy at Central European University, which is now in Vienna. Um, she's the vice chair of the working group three of IPCC. Um, she's the vice president of the Hungarian Scientific Panel on Climate Change. What is more impressive to me uh, was that she was the coordinating lead author on uh, assessment reports four and five, which were the last real assessment reports, because now we're starting to think, okay, there's nothing more to say. We've told you people, we need to move on. Okay, working group three may have a little bit more to, um, to add. Um, she has served on many distinguished roles with the United Nations and other international climate bodies, not that the United Nations exclusively is a climate body, with the European Commission, with the European Parliament, OECD, and the World Bank. She's given over 200 keynote speeches worldwide, so we're very lucky to have her here for this one tonight, including a very inspiring speech to a Hungarian ombudsman on climate in 2015, when a group of us present here was preparing a 2016 degrowth conference to be held in Budapest. So Diana, please, the floor is yours, and welcome to Zagreb. Ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, dear dignitaries, dear mayor and deputy mayor, I must admit, I'm pretty nervous. I actually never thought I would be, I would have stage uh, fright anymore after, as uh, it was in the introduction, after over, I think, much, well over 200 keynotes and a lot of media appearances when you're woken up at 3 a.m. from your bed by BBC World News and you're jumping on uh, primetime news in the U.S. Uh, and have to comment and, and summarize everything about climate change and action in two minutes. Um, I was already not nervous, but I'm nervous now. Why? I'm, um, I must admit I'm not a degrowth expert. I have a few publications related to it, and the whole thing started actually the many times referred to Budapest conference when I just heard degrowth, degrowth, what the hell is this? Well, it sounds interesting, but you know, I didn't have the money to go or nothing, so I just heard that there were these uh, volunteer opportunities. I, of course, would have been a bit um, ridiculous for me to go for as a volunteer, but I, I persuaded my daughter. <laughs> so, so my daughter volunteered, so she reported to me from the conference every day, and ever since then this kind of love affair has been going on. But I'm still not considering myself as part of the community, and I certainly would never have thought that uh, almost at the next conference I will be giving the keynote, and the keynote as since then, actually I'm IPCC vice chair, because in July I've been elected as IPCC vice chair, so certainly my, um, I, I do have to represent the organization, which you can imagine is not very easy in this particular conference. But anyway, so I am nervous, but let me give you some of my insights from, from a lot of the IPCC materials. Why, what is the case for uh, what is the climate case for changing the growth uh, paradigm? 
And I know many things you will know much better than I do, but uh, I hope, uh, so that's why I will click leave after my talk so that you can't beat me up. <laughs> but um, uh, you, you're welcome to send me emails. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I have been using this slide actually about this meme about climate change for quite a while. And I never really thought that I will be using it in a city which very much knows that this is actually, uh, and this was before I was using this meme, before actually it really came to reality. So, and I was thinking uh, yesterday how, which out of this summer's really old climate disasters, which one should I use to illustrate the severity? Then I just got this uh, WhatsApp from Julia Steinberger that she's really sad that she cannot hear me t uh, today. Uh, because her train is cancelled, because of the floods in Austria and because of the, the damage to the railway lines, I thought, well, we don't have to go on. For me, personally, really the biggest damage is that she won't be here tonight and I won't be able to have dinner with her. But I know that for many of you, this is much more serious. How many of you have been really affected by either a serious heat wave or flood or droughts in the last, uh, during the last summer? So that's... Ooh, that's a lot of cans. So anyway, yes, it's, uh, I don't have to go very far to illustrate uh, how serious this summer has been. And literally, climate, choose, climate change was the headline news almost every night. If not from our own city, then, then from all around the world. That was Slovenia, this is uh, Croatia, and this is, uh, the, these are the, uh, the fires uh, from Hawaii which already brought very significant damage. But I, you know, I could go on, but I don't want to take all the time on this. Um, the point is that actually we were surprised that it's, or we are really happy that we're, there wasn't more and that we are kind of at the end of the summer and we can, we can a little bit sigh from relief that there wasn't much worse. Why, why was I nervous? And I'm not a climate scientist per se, I'm working with three person, but when, we, we do know that, so this is actually from the same day as you were having also the floods, those the same things uh, in China as well. But this, this is the kind of, this is just one of the many charts that we have been bracing our hands, bracing um, since the spring. All, almost many climate indicators, I wouldn't say all, but very many climate indicators are just literally going off the map, going off the figure, going through the roof. And anyone, and what we are seeing around the world this year is nothing that we have seen ever before, not even just in civilization's history, but, but even if we go really back to planetary uh, uh, geological history. And this is just one, and again, I don't want to because that's not my point. But I just want, you know, the previous was sea surface temperatures. Globally, this is the temperature of the North Atlantic. Again, there is, we didn't even have these units before. Uh, or f we can even uh, look at the, uh, the um, Antarctic ice. And certainly you see that uh, um, now you see it even in not in green media at all, but uh, one of these figures are actually from The Economist and, and saying that, who was actually a climate skeptic for a very long period. If you're old enough, you remember very well how long, for a long time they've been trying to prove that there is no climate change. So yes, uh, let me share you a couple of insights about what we say about these uh, from the IPCC and, and walk you through Connect to to uh, why I think it is really important to explore uh, degrowth as a potential uh, solution. So yes, you know, you feel it, it's not big news, but what is big news in this, I think, is that we have said clearly that this, these changes are unprecedented in thousands of years. In fact, that's a typical IPCC conservative statement because if you actually look at the numbers, we, the global average temperature has not been so high for 125,000 years. Just in my lifetime, in less than my lifetime, we have rewinded the geological clock of the planet by 125,000 years. And we know that carbon dioxide concentrations determine temperature. They are very, uh, they have been all throughout Earth history have been very closely connected to the global temperature on the planet. This, 
the CO2 concentrations have not been so high for two million years. And we can go on and on uh, about uh, these figures. This is not from the IPCC, but um, this uh, is the figure where, which I like to use to show that um, why we should be worried about even just one degree of climate change, since often we get the question, I'm sure you get the question a lot, one degree centigrade, I mean, what is this hysteria about one degree? We don't even notice, right? We don't notice if it's one degree cooler or warmer at all. So why, um, um, it's, it sounds like hysteria, but the reason why it is not, and let me walk you through, it's a little bit difficult to be able to, oh yes, this way. So let me walk you through this figure. So this is the temperature history of our planet in the last 60 million years. This is not a linear scale, so here 50 uh, years is a unit, and here it's already 20 million years. So, of course, a lot of skeptics uh, are always saying that, yes, they have been always cooler and hotter, so why aren't we just accepting this and get, getting um, used to this, that yes, there is change, so let's just get used to it. Yes, it's true that there has been always cooler and, and warmer, but let's just stop a little bit. And let's think about the fact that we have homonoids on the planet for millions of years. Also, Homo sapiens has roamed the planet for hundreds of thousands of years. Still, only since when do we have civilization? Since when are we able to hear, sit here and discuss about degrowth and be in a wonderful museum and, and things like that? The only thing that enabled this is agri actually agriculture. And only since when do we have agriculture? Since we have agriculture, the reason why we have agriculture, because for 10,000 years, the climate has stepped into a very stable era. The climate has not come out of a one degree centigrade zone in the last 10,000 years. So everything that we do and every, the way how we developed, you know, where we have our infrastructure, what we eat, what we like, what we don't eat, um, where is our wealth, um, where many people live, where, don't any, where no people live, and so on and so on. All of this have been very finely tuned to a certain climate and a very stable climate. So already this very stable climate, already this we have kicked out by one degree centigrade. So we already are experimenting, and I liked very much this, uh, this title. This was from, from, uh, from a media, yes. But yes, it's today's infrastructure was built for a climate that no longer exists. Yes, we, have, we are, have entered a very different climate to what civilization has been used to. But let's look at what will be the climate of of, I'm just looking at my little son is there and he's nine years old, what's going to be the climate when he's going to be my age or, or, or a bit older? So because it's very difficult to say. And so one thing, one way we can look at it is let's look at what the world planet was like when it was last like that. So if we look at the f different scenarios, the red is of course the worst and the blue is the best. If um, if you're not really good enough, then, then we may increase the temperature by the end of the century, let's say maybe four to five degrees, let's say four degrees. Let's see what the last time the planet was like that, what, uh, when, what he will experience if we are seriously not changing course. So let's start to go back and back. And we already don't have civilization and agriculture. And we are going back, we don't have homo sapiens. We're going back, we don't have hominoids, we don't have ice on the northern hemisphere. We're going back and it's roughly here that we hit. So the last time the Earth climate was like what he is going to experience was 20 to 40 million years ago. So just in a matter of a generation, basically in my lifetime, we are returning the geological clock of the planet so significantly. Anyway, I could go on and on about this, but let me just pick one particular impact, which I think is quite relevant to the degrowth and also one of my messages. So this is one of the figures uh, from uh, the synthesis report of our latest report of the, of the IPCC. And it shows that um, 
it shows that there are limits to how far we can go, with the, even with the temperature. Even though we would think, who cares for one degree more or three degrees more? But we tend to forget that actually we do have biological limitations because we operate at 36 degrees cent, uh, centigrade and we always have to get rid of heat because we are eating, so we burn that food and we have to get rid of that heat. For that, if you, I don't know how many of you like physics, but if you were good in your physics class, then you know heat only flows from hot to cold, so it has to be colder outside than you are in order to be able to get rid of your heat. Yes, sometimes temporarily you can still survive higher temperatures as long as you can sweat. Um, but if the humidity is high, you can no longer sweat, you can get, no longer get rid of heat, and it's soon deadly. So even if we think it's, um, there is, you know, we, let's just get used to it. No, physically, we are just not, we, we just can't. As a species, a biological species, we cannot get used to a certain level of warmer climate. So what this shows is what, at certain degrees of temperature uh, warming, how many days of the year, which parts of the world, will the, the uh, place will be just uninhabitable. So the thing is, and so this is from the IPCC report, but this is a paper from PNES uh, earlier on the same thing. Uh, well, sorry, I just don't have the PNES here, the to be. Anyway, so um, this showed the same thing, and basically it states that by even 2050, under normal climate scenarios, 3.5 billion people will live in areas which are basically going to be uninhabitable because these, this, these are the areas where now the wet bulb temperature, this is what we call the uninhabitable uh, temperatures or climates, are going to be uh, in the shaded areas, which is now here in, by 2070 we'll have that climate where um, in the shaded areas. Now, of course, I'm sure not you, but if I, would, if I show this to another conference, they just say, okay, so what's... So we just get AC, so who cares, you know, it's okay. So, and even I used to think oh, quite two months ago this way that, okay, in the worst case, we'll just get you really, you know, just a lot of air conditioning and, and save these people. Now, the bad news is the following. The problem is that the vast majority of the world will not even have a refrigerator by 2050 and not even by 20, 2100, even under the most optimistic development growth, even under the most optimistic, most, uh, I guess in this conference I shouldn't say optimistic growth scenarios, right? So even under the <laughs> most uh, aggressive <laughs> economic growth, So even in the most aggressive economic growth scenarios, will not even give fridges to billions of people, let alone air conditioners. So what you see here is the amount of billions of people which just will not have access to air conditioning in uh, these areas under these different scenarios. Yes, we can do something with good technology or better buildings, but still there is a huge cooling gap. So that means that we are sentencing a large part of the population either to death or to having to migrate and someone, I don't know who, taking them up. And so this is also um, the same paper from the same paper from Shonali Pachauri. And this is the share of the urban population not being able to have air conditioning, access to air conditioning in, by 2050. And uh, so no access. Uh, uh, so that is still a very, very significant share of who will just not have. So simply this, uh, this we very rarely talk about this, that in fact this is a death sentence to a very high share of the population if we go uh, on this way. So it's just one of the examples. But the good news is, and what the IPCC says, that yes, there is no going back from many of the changes in the climate system. However, some changes, and in fact many, can be slowed and others can be still stopped by limiting warming. And the good news is, oh sorry, I will tell the good news, but this is, I really like this illustration to show, to illustrate that, and I'm sure you know the climate stripes, like, 
right? The climate stripes are uh, for every year we see we depict the year with a color, the average temperature of that particular year. And what this is uh, figure one of the synthesis report of the six assessment report. I really like this because it nicely illustrates actually why there is no political action. So let me actually walk you through the not official version. This, this is the not quite official version of the same figure. Uh, especially the, this one and this part was added by, by some, uh, by some uh, very good, uh, not, not the IPCC. Uh, anyway, so what this shows is that, uh, yes, this is my life. Uh, we will not be able to go back to the same climate anymore. We, uh, uh, but, and this is my, my son's, my little son's life, but there is still a big difference in, so we cannot go back to your yellows and, and blues anymore. But there is still a very big difference if his life is going to be in the, stay in the orange or he will have to go to hell in the, in the purple. And I also like this one very much, this edit later row flakes, because it kind of illustrates why there is no, why there is more limited political action. Because many of our decision makers, except our fantastic uh, mayor present, but many of our decision makers are from the generation who have lived in a different climate, who are not going to be experiencing this climate anymore. But, and they think that for the little thing that they still have here, they have the money to protect themselves. So they are not going to be affected. So it's very difficult uh, to expect them. But we understand why these people are on, on the streets uh, for sure. So yes, there is definitely still very big difference if uh, already we know that we are going to reach 1.5 soon. But there is a very diff difference whether we go to five or we stay at this particular temperature level. And this, is, this sounds like you know, something that we've known before and, and someone made, an, made a, a point that, oh, we have said that many times. But actually, no, there are so many new messages and in fact, there are so many things that we still have no idea about, about the climate system, especially with the tipping points and, for example, why all of these values are going off the charts. We have no idea and there are many things we really don't understand yet. But anyway, so this point sounds like everyone knows, but just a little bit of detail. So the good news is, and this is quite new good news, that as soon as we stop emitting carbon dioxide, the warming will stop. And this is really great news because for a long time we thought that there is a long uh, um, inertia. Thank you. That was what the long, uh, word I was looking for. Long inertia. No, actually, the great news is that this is what we have to do. Uh, but that if we do that, then we, we will be safe. So that's really good news. But the other part of that story, which is not written in this message, but which, if you put, look at it from the other perspective, that, um, that limiting human-induced warming to any specific level requires reaching at, reaching at least net zero emissions. So that means that, okay, we'll let one and a half go. We'll let two degrees go. We'll let three degrees go. We'll let five degrees go. But anywhere we want to stop climate change, we still have to go to net zero, or zero, as I will mention later. So that means Zero is non-negotiable because certainly we know, I think with that anyone would agree, that a 10 degree warmer climate, humanity just cannot survive, um, or civilization. So, but if we know that we have to go to zero anyway, then it's a huge responsibility how soon we do that. Because the sooner we do that, the lower the temperature we stabilize our, uh, our climate at. So what we do, in the next few years, or the next decade, or in my service as the next, as the vice chair of, in, during the next cycle of the next assessment report, the seventh assessment report, is enormous responsibility because really this will determine the, the, how, what will be the climate for him, for my little son later on, and, and for his children and your grandchildren and so on. So that's a tremendous, we know that it's urgent, but it's even more urgent. So, but let's just then get back to this net zero thing. So what about the net zero? So you know that this is about our biggest splash in IPCC history, our, our uh, report on one and a half degrees. And these are the net zero figures. Actually, 
it, when you say that nothing happened on climate change, I totally disagree. We did this figure, we didn't even, we did say you have to go to net zero actually at all. In fact, if you notice the zero line is very innocently, you know, it just happens to me in the middle of the figure, which usually it isn't, and it's not red or anything. All we did, we depicted this, this, and just three years later, three years later, 90% or countries responsible for 90% of all of emissions had net zero plans, net zero goals. So that's a pretty big change because at this time when we had that, if you had said net zero, you were a hippie, a tree hugger who were, you know, definitely your grant was taken away. So research grant. So and it's pretty much changed. But the point is, um, this is from the report, and, and I deliberately want to show first this one, because I also want to show how we are learning and we are actually, you, you, from your work, is really influencing what uh, the IPCC, even the scenario work, is doing. Because let's, how to get to net zero, let's just, let's just uh, decompose three lines, or actually I want to only focus on P4 for now. But yes, so this is net zero in 2050, and now almost everyone has a net zero, uh, 2050 net zero target. But if we decompose these lines, so this is P4, so that's one, one spaghetti from that previous spaghetti, how we can get there. And the gray is, you know, fossil fuels related emissions, uh, the orange is uh, land use related emissions, and, ye and yellow is the bioenergy combined carbon capture and storage, so basically negative emissions. So, yes, so notice many of the scenarios have these very big yellow negative things. So the literature has, or a scientific community has been quite, started to be quite critical about this. I just, I don't want to delve into that because some numbers I will say later on, but if just you think about just one single thing that here, you know, I, in my life, I will still enjoy my life and, and you know, fly around and, and do all, all the nice things, and then he will have to pay for all of that, right? Because this is not going to be, this is not going to be paying back. This is all heavy uh, things that, uh, here we have a lot of ways to get down emissions in a profitable ways, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and so on. But negative emissions have no profitability without a serious carbon price. So certainly there is a very, very big intergenerational justice uh, issue here, but there are many other things as well. So the same figure in um, the six assessment reports, so these are the different, the, um, are so-called illustrative pathways from, um, from the Working Group 3 report. If you notice, they, go much less down, so there are no more 20 gigatons per year uh, negative emissions, but there are still quite substantial uh, negative emissions towards the end of the century, uh, the way to, to um, reach this uh, net zero that we talked about. So let's look at what does this actually mean, how we can achieve this. So these are the different illustrative pathways and don't need to get into the details. Th simply the point is that many of th these don't reach uh, not even two degrees centigrade. So these are kind of current policies and moderate action and so on. But those that actually do reach some level of climate targets, they do have quite some negative emissions, although not as big, but still they still have some. So let's look at actually how big they are. So this is how it looks like on the energy uh, field. It, from the energy perspective are different illustrative scenarios. So what you see is that basically all scenarios that actually go to zero require very substantial between three to eight gigatons of removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it forever. Now, mostly this uh, it's either from energy supply uh, related so for, for with carbon capture and storage or just land use change and um, and tree planting and sort of the thing, you know, when you're flying and you can play extremely expensive, or you don't fly, of course, fortunately, but let's, uh, many things, many, now almost you do anything, you can offset your emissions. I will talk about that in a minute, but, uh, so this requires a lot uh, of, on all of, uh, very heavily on these negative emissions uh, technologies. So, but still, there is quite a lot of uh, worry in the scientific literature about this. Because uh, remember in the numbers, I said about between three to, let's say, 
eight or nine gigatons per year. This is a lot. We emit about 50 gigatons. The removing uh, three to eight gigatons a year, this is really very substantial and getting rid of it forever. And it's not like you will do it and then you can give it up, but then you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But let's just look at one particular paper, which was, it's not even new, about what actually, just removing three gigatons, so that's the lowest, from the lowest standard, just removing three gigatons means just from some indicators. That would mean that we would need to use over three times the word total harvested area for land uh, for cereal production. We would need to use twice the word annual water use for agriculture. That's the biggest user of water uh, in the planet. We would use 20 times the US annual nutrient uh, use and so on and so on. So basically, even three gigatons would require so much other resources that it's just very difficult. Not, not only is it, is it very resource intensive, but also who will really pay for this when we can't even give refrigerators for the majority of the world or let alone air conditioning, who is going to pay for this enormous, because these are not cheap. Yes, you may be seen to be buying your cheap offsets, but actually these are no, not cheap uh, things at all, because we may think that uh, just we are, yes, planting trees is really extremely important, but unfortunately, you see through the fires, you see through um, also with the warming, actually many of the forests are becoming more sources than sinks. We just don't see that, uh, that a lot of the tree planting really massively and on a large scale saving um, saving uh, or really emitting avoiding carbon emissions the other thing is and this is not from the scientific literature so that's a strong caveat it is private literature and maybe maybe it's all wrong maybe it's all the well-paid anti-oil um, advocates, uh, the rich anti-oil advocates who all were sponsored to, uh, to uh, for do some of this biased research. Um, anyway, even if that, perhaps it's worth uh, just looking at that, that uh, if we look at all the different offsets so far, it turns out that actually 94% has been questioned. And in fact, of the 29 projects, only eight reduced any emissions at all, and, um, and basically what we see is that very little of the offset projects we see that are really reducing and we're not even yet looking at whether they will be there forever. So simply the issue is that we really have to ask, but this is not my IPCC hat, this is just my private hat, that if we all have to go on a diet, is it really worth you know, paying someone else to go on a diet for us. So we all have to go to, to zero. So if we just engage in all this trading, of course there are, I'm sure, there is going to be very interesting debates whether it's worth or not. But certainly there are lots of questions already I mentioned the, or about the integrity of many of the offsets and negative emissions. But perhaps, and there is also the ethical risk, because now that we say, okay, it's okay because we can keep using because we just have, we'll just have more negative emissions. We have the technology, so we don't have to do anything. But the point is that we will need negative emissions in any case, because many of um, some of the sectors are just not, right now we just don't have the technologies to, um, to decarbonize. So that means, yes, we can reduce the emissions to some extent, and also we could reduce demand uh, to some extent, but we need to build cities. We just need to build cities that we cannot avoid some uh, use of cement for building uh, the cities for in the developing countries. So that means uh, that we will need some negative emissions, and perhaps it would be better to use the cheaper uh, offset opportunities uh, for that. So, as a result, and I won't, don't want to go into a lot of details on that, but as a result of, of that, a lot of scientists, including, for example, the former chair of uh, the IPCC, um, published several times um, different perspectives that net zero is a dangerous trap. We have to go to zero and not net zero. 
it's not an IPCC position at all. But okay, let's see then how how can we do to net zero if 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 this doesn't work perfectly. So it's not just like you know we just get the miraculous technology which could be a tree or a machine which just takes sucks the, uh, the CO2 out and we just store it. It doesn't really quite work that way. Well, let's see what other um, levers we have to to get to zero, because. Um, Yes, a lot of uh, the, especially the richer countries, love blaming, and we do. We know that even some of the really influential environmental celebrities are still blaming overpopulation. But we will see how population is not going to solve our climate crisis at all, because at most population may uh, may grow by 20 percent by the end of the century. And if we keep the three percent growth per year, how much is the world economy going to grow by? By 2100, I'm sure many of you know what percent we will grow by the end of the century if we just keep the 3% growth per year. Guesses? 300? Other guesses? 600, thank you. 100? Actually, it's 1100. It's a staggering 1,100% as compared to the 20%. So it's very nice to blame the, the poor who are having more children for the problems, but actually it is not them, but it's our consumption that it's really uh, going up. But anyway, so let's look at a little bit more. Um, these are the three main levers that we can have to get zero. So just let's look at these uh, a little bit more. So. Technology, we looked a little bit already at, um, especially the, tech, the wonderful technology of the tree. But there are some promising technologies. For example, one of the strongest messages we had from the fifth assessment, uh, sorry, sixth assessment report is that um, the cost of renewables have really fallen a lot. And in fact, uh, they have fallen more than anyone would have ever predicted. Every year, the International Energy Agency predicted the price of renewables and how much, and solar energy, and how much they are going to um, disperse, and they have always under-predicted. So yes, this is really good news that by today, some of the renewables are not only competitive, but even cheaper than fossil fuels. Solar energy now is the cheapest energy source on the vast uh, area of the planet in most of the countries, of course, if you take away all the different subsidies, so just looking out on a cost basis. And as a result, yes, there is fantastic um, uh, uh, major um, proliferation of these technologies. So that's, that's great news. There are just two issues here. One is that, fantastic, but do we see emissions then coming down? Not really. Last year, we still had the highest level of emissions as before, despite all the fantastic commissions, commitments to net zero, despite all these amazing successes. And it's not a small success. I mean, literally, in Hungary, we um, even um, already, or an annual uh, electricity production, 10% of it comes from solar energy. And uh, I checked uh, the other day in the morning at 9 a.m. we were producing 50% of all of our electricity at that time from, from solar power. And this doesn't even include all the roof integrated. So it is a major revolution. But still, emissions are not going down. Why? Because our demand keeps increasing more than even the fastest growing renewable energy can grow, which is growing faster than we ever thought. But even that cannot keep up with the pace of our growth, uh, of uh, growth of demand. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is that it's a myth that we will ever have clean energy. The only clean energy is the energy that we never use or never produce. And I think it's a really, uh, I'm not going to be able to prove this, and this is not an IPCC statement. It's more a phys my physicist statement that, that I've been teaching, actually, on these three um, decades. But just two, uh, two little illustrations. When we were uh, defending this figure in um, the IPCC plenary, and, and we were discussing, and, and I just sat next to this Argentinian author, and 
And when we were saying, oh, this is really, that's our biggest message and the strongest and most positive message, he just said on, you know, hardly, it was hardly possible to hear that. If you look around in my countries, there is nothing on this to celebrate. So we celebrate this. But the reason why we celebrate is because we tucked all the, all the negative impacts of this revolution into the poor countries. Now we start to see, start to perhaps understand that maybe not everything, all of this is coming uh, for free. For example, in Hungary, you might have heard there is a lot of discussion about becoming a solar battery um, um, power or solar battery empire and, and having a lot of, uh, sorry, um, electric vehicle battery um, empire so that we are, uh, we are building a lot of uh, manufacturing capacities for, uh, for um, electric vehicle batteries. And there is, of course, a lot of uh, opposition to that because uh, it's very high energy consuming. It also d has very high water demand and it can also have um, pollution if not properly uh, done, then you can have emissions. And at the same time, also often these have to be on greenfield investments. So, of course, environmentalists would say, yeah, no, 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 we don't want this. But I actually think that as long as we want to drive around, we have to tolerate them. In fact, and I said that on media, it wasn't very popular. Uh, interestingly, they never really invited me back again. Um, but I said that, that, in fact, I think that all these battery factories should be next door to the most affluent neighborhoods with all the Jeeps. Because, yeah, because we, it's not a solution that we just tuck all of, our, uh, all of the pollution into other corners of the world and then we think these are fantastic news. These are fantastic news, but the problem is they are alone not solving yet uh, the puzzle of, uh, of reducing emissions. So these are the different ways how, if you decompose those uh, emission scenarios and what type of energy they are, um, energy they are constituted from. So we, you see that even in the most ambitious uh, uh, renewable energy scenario, we, are, uh, we started, but we still are not reducing emissions. So let's actually then go to, the, to the, this other um, part of the equation. We looked at uh, the, um, the population times impact uh, times technology, the IPAD equations. So yes, if we look at the, these are, the, the drivers of the different IPCC scenarios uh, and uh, the dotted lines are some reference scenarios from other places. So let's look at population. Yes, it could go really bad, but in fact, it's, in most scenarios, actually, it, it stabilizes fairly soon and it's not going to be the one that either ruins or solves uh, the climate puzzle. Uh, interestingly, all or most of the IPC scenarios are under the UN um, uh, medium uh, scenario, so they assume lower uh, population than uh, the UN medium scenario. On the other hand, if we look at final energy, interestingly, it's only one of the SSPs that are under or, uh, or according to that, but most of the scenarios uh, assume much higher final energy use than even the um, the OECD, sorry, no, the IEA's word uh, energy outlook. And if we look at uh, growth, economic growth, so if you look at the OECD long-term economic growth scenario, this is the dotted line. So all the IPCC scenarios, or most of the IPCC scenarios, that's a 95% is the gray shaded area, actually assume higher um, growth rates than the, what the OECD uh, is uh, projecting. So, uh, and this, this puzzled me the most, that food demand, uh, this is uh, kilocalories per ca capita per day, I I'm just not quite sure why most scenarios actually go uh, to as much to 3,000 to 3,500 calories per day. I'm not sure why, why is that really our, you know, why is our well-being so much better if we get so much more calories per day when we actually need only about 2,000. So uh, certainly, to me, this uh, does raise a lot of uh, questions, and this is um, already how this is uh, depicted, that you either have per capita GDP or you have uh, population. So, um, but the good news is that, uh, that actually all this scenario uh, 
thinking of the IPCC, which is um, very heavily determining the outcomes and very heavily determining our messages and also um, very heavily um, listened to by the decision-making communities and also the political communities, in especially international negotiating uh, processes. Actually, degrowth is very much on the radar screen. Even if you search for the word degrowth, you will not find too many occurrences, but it is there. For example, it is recognized, reference to many of uh, your peoples, uh, of your papers, that also uh, uh, scenarios, uh, GDP scenarios outside of this range have some plausibility, including the option of economic decline, not degrowth, economic decline, uh, or much faster, even much faster economic uh, uh, development. And you see there are some further discussions of, uh, of degrowth, but here is a longer uh, discussion of, um, of uh, this. So there is, uh, of, of f from the degrowth literature, so there is a recognition that yes, perhaps we should understand more about this, we should explore this space more. And it has been fantastic that you, and, and thank you for also involving me, have been publishing papers about this, that yes, we do need more research on this, more scenarios exploring this, and it's great that uh, many of you, or several of you, are involved in producing some of the degrowth scenarios exactly for this, these scenario maps, which is uh, really important. But we are still very far from understanding and being able to integrate a lot of what you are going to be discussing this whole week in the IPCC or in the mainstream, not even the IPCC, because IPCC is basically just integrating and reviewing all the scientific literature. But for example, I want to just uh, bring out another area where which uh, of these scenarios, which is also very relevant for, for you and for so many of your discussions uh, this week. And this is about, um, this is a paper from actually an Indian lady who is actually one of the key negotiators uh, in the IPCC. And what she has, what they have done is just looked at the IPCC scenarios and depicted uh, this, are, this is, you don't see this unfortunately, but these are, because for some reason this became, becomes black and I just couldn't get rid of that. But the title is here, just uh, they are covered by black. But these are uh, GDP uh, changes uh, in, um, in, in the different IPCC uh, types of scenarios. These are two different, four different families of scenarios. It doesn't really matter. But the point is that, uh, that while we are still assuming really high, especially in these family of scenarios, we are still assuming enormous growth, GDP growth in the already rich regions. We are still, I don't know if it's true, I really have to, say it's a published journal article, so it went through peer review, but it looks so shocking to me that li literally I just hardly can believe that it is true that our scenarios really are truly assuming so, terribly low growth rates for those who are yet very poor, who don't have yet a refrigerator, let alone air conditioning, and those of us who have all of this, we are still just growing and growing, and even uh, the more sustainable type of SSPs are still uh, assuming this enormous growth rate. For energy, it's almost uh, uh, the same. So yes, at least the good news is that for North America and Western Europe and the other scenario classes are similar, so I'm just showing one figure, they assume quite a big reductions in per capita uh, energy use. On the other hand, um, and also for the Middle East and, and some of uh, the richer Asia, on the other hand, those, those who are still deprived of energy access, they still are very low, at very low, they are assumed to grow very little in terms of per capita energy use in the scenarios. Again, I don't know if it's true, but the point is, and this is why I'm showing this to you, that when I try to talk about degrowth in IPCC, or just mention the word, immediately, of course, there is, there is no, 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 we can't talk about this. Um, but one of the reasons I understand if most of our scenarios still assume that a large portion of the world who is basically kind of sentenced to death, they also have no, uh, none of the scenarios assume reasonable 
growth for them or reasonable opportunities for them to have decent living standards, then of course they are allergic to anything when we talk about something sounding like a, no, a rich North uh, concept. So, um, so let me just, um, yes, uh, if politicians have a bit, can speak uh, a bit longer than perhaps, let me also just uh, debunk perhaps one for final myth about, uh, about what could keep our growth, because uh, circular economy has become a very sexy term. And I was actually pretty shocked when I read our own report this is what our report says about, this is word by word from our report. So, um, because circular economy is the, the buzzword, and even in many environmental circles, this is the buzzword, let's go to circular economy. But actually, this is what the scientific, if you assess all the scientific literature, this is what it, uh, it says about that. Because actually the circular economy is kind of an escape. We, yeah, we're not growing, we're just going around and around and around, so it's okay, it's okay, we're just going around, it's fine, you know, it's fine to use more and more because we are just going to recycle it, no problem. So that's what, this is what the scientific literature says about this. Many publications, many of them non-peer-reviewed, eulogize the perceived benefits of the circular economy, but stop short of providing a quantitative assessment. Promotion of circular economy from this perspective has been criticized as greenwashing attempt by industry. Most of the methodological rigorous publications found only small potentials to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the circular economy. And here are the actual reasons why uh, this is more difficult. So I don't want to go through all of them, but um, but basically the point is that even if you would say that, okay, you know, it's okay because we just, we just get into this circle and then it's okay to grow and, and consume more. No, unfortunately, even this is not going to save us. Yes, as long as we, I, I now like to call the circular economy more an elliptical, if it's more an oval or elliptical, which is really focusing on durability, long lifetime and so on, then perhaps that part is good. But and, and certainly we have to recycle, there is no question or reuse, but don't over, um, uh, even if we have utopias, that's, uh, let's not put a utopia on that we are just going to recycle everything and then it's going to solve everything. So my final point, this is absolutely not from the scientific literature, it's uh, just my um, provocation, that my final provocation, that in fact, if you don't just look forward, but just look backward, how much of our recent growth, how much of this, and I'm, I know you know this better, but, but I still want to talk about this because I don't hear a lot about this. And I, I think this does need to be talked much more, not in your community, but outside of this community to everyday people. When those, to those people who are just really afraid of, of you know, muttering the word degrowth and no, no. Um, but how much of our recent growth has really been growing our well-being? And let's just start thinking about that. So how have we been able to achieve the, you know, the 3% growth per year or, or how can actually companies always, because now it's in the system, we, they always have to grow. They always have to sell more than last year. They always have to sell more than, than uh, their competing companies. And if they don't, then they are deeply in trouble. So, but what, you know, what happened um, uh, in the, uh, actually in the, uh, in the, first part of the previous century, in, in the 20th century, after the first war when, you know, finally the United States had almost every, in every household, there was a refrigerator, there was air conditioning, there was washing machine, there, was, there were two cars parked in the garage, so, but the car companies still had to grow, the fridge companies still have to grow, they still had to sell more than previous year. So how do you do that if you have all these great fridges and cars which operate for 50 years and, and do a good service? So they started to have to come up with all kinds of other things to, to sell more, to keep the growth. Because the, so the only way many of these companies were able to keep up their 
growth uh, plans and the growth obligation is plant obsolescence. Poor materials, fast obsolete softwares, today, not then, no access to codes to enable repair, no access to spare parts, inaccessibility or overpaid servicing, no warranties. We know that, or at least those who are older, we know that, that uh, our th we have to, st how, I don't know how long, is how long have you worn your shoe that you are wearing? Probably not very long. Uh, how long did you wear a shoe, let's say, three decades ago? Probably significantly longer. And of course, you know this very well. But so the growth, yes, we are probably making more money. But in fact, we have to rebuy the same thing more and more frequently. So is it really making us happier that the same shoe that I buy, I'm not using for 10 years, but, but I have to rebuy it and rebuy it all the time? And if that wasn't enough, they had to create faster and faster fashion. So in car industry, we see in the scientific literature how the um, also fashion came uh, be, to become very important so that they can sell. Even if you have the great car and it's still functioning, but somehow we, I need to persuade you to still buy another one because you're not keeping up with the Jones. You're, you're not trendy enough. And, uh, and of course, marketing, and we are all the victims of that. And it's incredibly difficult today to really resist thinking that I'm, I'm a better person, or I'm, I have more status, or I'm more elegant, or I'm more whatever, if I don't have the latest uh, phone, or, or whatever, or the latest app. Or, or, and, and, and I don't know how many of you are parents, and how you struggle that with your children to, to teach them, look, you know, let's, yes, perhaps your peers have it, but it's really not going to make you happier. But it's very, very difficult to teach them when, when that's what they hear from everywhere. And, but we went all the way, not only just uh, billions of, uh, of uh, or I don't even know the numbers, but, but huge amount of, of marketing. Uh, so right now, uh, the, many of the companies are uh, spending more on psychologists who, rewire, psychologists who are rewiring our brains that we really actually cannot live happy or cannot live without that thing, to rebuy that thing, than the psychologists who will heal us after our addictions to those things. Because this sounds uh, overstatement, but, uh, but how many of us or how many of our children are addicted to social media very openly or, or, or um, or not openly, we know that this is uh, killing people from the opioid crisis, from, from the anorexia crisis, uh, from all uh, the, um, uh, the eating disorders and so on. These are, a lot of these are on purpose so that companies can meet their growth aspirations. So yes, uh, the final uh, picture is from from the centuries when, where we had a lot of tram lines and the car companies bought up the tram lines so that they can uh, buy, uh, sell more cars. So yes, we are in this rat race, in this growth rat race. And um, so what I wanted to leave you with is just a couple of um, questions for thought for the rest of uh, your uh, week from my perspective. Because yes, I do want to conclude that it's extremely important to have more research on whether and how degrowth could contribute to uh, solving the climate puzzle and turning down finally the emission curves. Because so far, uh, there are concerns with almost every of the pathway that we have looked at. But we do need a lot more research to actually establish many of uh, the, uh, many of how the hows, how we can actually integrate. Uh, but I do want to also provoke you. So there are two things where uh, I, as a bridge, I'm not from your community, but I do consider myself as a bridge between your community and the climate community. If, if you think, and I think it is really important because of the urgency that we consider uh, degrowth much more seriously. But then for that, we need two things from your community. One thing is um, that, um, that trying perhaps political agendas, let's keep the political agendas not so strongly integrated with the actual degrowth scholarship. Uh, the problem is that I think that often turns, we now have to unite and 
we, oh, the climate crisis we have to solve with right governments, left governments, orange governments, red, red governments, black governments, green governments, any kind of government. The same way, uh, also here, I think it's really important that the degrowth scholarship and thinking is, becomes more mainstream in the climate community. But then I think it's good if we keep the how to implement that. And I know there are many debates among you. What is the way to implement that? Some of them uh, require political change. Others perhaps are more conservative. But I think so that's, that's one uh, of uh, the important messages. The other, it's not a request, but just I think it would be nice to perhaps consider another word. Because the problem is <laughs> it's still saying no to something. And I think you're not saying no to something, you're saying yes to a better world, to a better planet. And I think we, we need a word that is a positive word, which is communicating that. Uh, and along with that, it's really, the reason is why, because most in the climate community are just hearing the word and are just shutting off or, 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 or asking the others to leave the room. But if it was a more positive word that actually already communicated that it is not for everyone to degrow, but it is for leaving space for those Global South people who won't have air conditioning by the middle of the uh, century, for them to leave more development space. That's why especially we need to consider our growth so that they can so that they can actually grow more. So anyway, these were uh, some of my uh, provocations. And because also on the political aspect, I just want uh, to suggest that you read this chapter of mine. It's really not, uh, uh, it's very inaccessible, so I can uh, send it to you. But in this, what I did is, it was my first, pub almost my first publication, but I very rigorously analyzed the positive and negative aspects of communism and the centrally planned economy on environment, on emissions, energy use, and resource use. And I think it has a lot of relevance now to a lot of your work and a lot of your proposals. In which way did communism actually did environment uh, much worse and why did it increase our emissions and, and environmental aspects? On the other hand, in which aspect it has been much it's very positive? So which, because you, uh, I think you can definitely use in many of your suggestions. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I will be very happy to be in touch. And I wish you a really exciting week and a lot of uh, good discussions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Olga Vorset. Apologies again for missing the, the, the IPC Vice Chair and congratulations. Um, we'll now continue this discussion in a more convivial atmosphere. Deep gratitude again to the museum for hosting us here tonight. I do want to remind you that we do have a curfew at 10 o'clock, but now please proceed to the foyer where we'll both serve some drinks and some uh, food refreshments as well as some specially curated music for tonight. Yeah.